A ver. All right, and welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study here at Expedition Church of the Triad. Hallelujah. And uh, we are located at 6302 Walter Wright Road here in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina. And, of course, if you're familiar with the area, you know it's just a suburb of Greensboro. Um, we're right into the city limits of Greensboro, just down the road here. So we'd love to have you come out and be with us, spend time with us, enjoy the Word with us, enjoy the move of the Spirit with us, and uh, be a part of what we're doing here at Expedition Church. Praise God. <coughs> Glad to have everybody out tonight. Praise God. Go ahead with your Bibles and open up to the 17th chapter of the book of Genesis. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 17. Hallelujah. And we'll be reading all, uh, we'll just read verses 1 through, well, let's see here. We'll read through verse 9. How about that? All right. And when Abram was 90 and 9 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, or El Shaddai. We know that from our previous teachings. Uh, the God that's more than enough, the Almighty God, the all-sufficient God. Um, walk before me and be thou perfect or mature or, you know, not, this is not, again, when the Bible uses the word perfect in relation to us doing something, it is not talking about uh, lacking fault. Okay, it, is, it usually denotes maturity or fullness, but not imperfection. Okay, um, and I will make my co and this is what God. This is God speaking now. I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, and see, God's declaring his side of this thing. <clears throat> He's told Abram what to do. Walk before me and be perfect. You know, walk in the things I'm telling you to walk in. But for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. This is God talking. Now remember when um, Eleazar, when Abram was about 87, God, God, he goes to God and says, look, you know, what, what are you going to do for me seeing I go um, childless? That, that, that wasn't 87, it was earlier. And uh, <coughs> <coughs> praise the Lord. There we go. Yeah, it's with, it's, it was when he was said. See, I go childless, and this, the only one in my house is Eleazar. He's going to inherit everything. God, God tells him, I'm going to make a covenant with you, and he, and, you know, and then um, goes on from there. So anyway, but God says, I'm going to establish my covenant. Amen. He's made you a father. I have. I have. Now, Abraham ha hadn't got a son yet. I have made thee the father of many nations. Not I'm, not I'm going to. Not one day. I have. Glory to God. And I will make I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations. For an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thy seed, unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land where thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting covenant possession, and I will be their God. Now listen, all, you know, all the fuss about the Gaza Strip and, you know, where Israel is and all that stuff. God gave that land to Abraham and his descendants. Amen. But everybody around them doesn't want them to have that. Why? Because they've got, got the devil in them. It's the spirit of Antichrist. It's against. The, see, God has two lineages, all right, from Abraham. He has the natural seed of Abraham, which he still holds his covenant to them. 
okay? He, the, the covenant of God with Abraham was not disavowed because of the spiritual covenant. It's a two-pronged covenant. And so the natural lineage of Abraham, the Jews, still walk in the promises that God said. Then there's a spiritual covenant, the Israel of God, which we are, okay? Because if you be Christ, then you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. All right? But God will fulfill his covenant promise to the natural descendants of Abraham when this whole thing gets wrapped up. They will be regrafted in. Amen? We were the wild olive branch. We got grafted in. How much easier is it going to be for the natural olive branch to be grafted in? Amen? Okay. And um, everlasting covenant. And God, and God said to Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. And then he goes on talks about circumcision and all, you know. And we, we know, the, well, you can read the rest of this chapter if you want to. All right. So what do we have here? Well, number one, we have a covenant between God and Abraham. Can you say amen? God and God, listen, God is the initiator of this covenant. Abram did not go to God looking to cut a covenant. God came to Abraham, Abram and initiated a covenant. Okay. God set the rules. God, um, if you'll read the book, and I think it was, it's, it's good reading, and it gives you some insight. There's a book, uh, if it, it may not be in print, but you can, you can usually get a copy of it. Um, online, like a used whatever. It may still be in print. I'm not sure. It's by the author H, initial H, Clay Trumbull, and it's called The Blood Covenant. And it covers the travels of Stanley and Livingston across Africa. Okay? It covers that. And in that, he, they, he goes into great depth where the writings, I, I forgot which one was that hit. I think it may have been... Livingston, that was the one that was out there, and Stanley was looking for him. I can't remember right off, okay? But how he went through Africa and had to start making covenants with people, tribes, to be able to live, <laughs> number one, and for supplies and all kinds of stuff. And he cut the covenant I, it's almost countless times. He had to cut and make blood covenant with, with tribes. Well, when they came to make the covenant, they would come out, and they would have the blessing and cursing declaration. Literally. You know, as we enter into this covenant, you know, all that I have is yours. Even to my wife and children belong to you. All my possessions belong to you. You know, and then you make your, you know, the other, other party would make their promise to them. And then they said the witch doctor would come out and pronounce all these God-awful curses on the party if they were to break the covenant. Hello. <laughs> they, were, they, they said make your blood crawl. <laughs> it just, I mean, you know, I don't know, the fleas of a thousand camels will infest your armpits, you know. <laughs> Something, I know, whatever. <clears throat> that would be pretty bad. I mean, four gnats your eyeballs would be bad enough for me. Okay? And, um, and so they got to see this blessing and cursing going across Africa. And that's how, that's how he made it through to where, wherever the other one found the other one. I, I, again, I don't remember which one was the one that was being searched out. <laughs> see, one of them had gone, the other, went, other either, it was either Livingston went and Stanley was looking for him or vice versa. I just don't remember. Right off, because it's not in my notes. I wasn't even talking about doing that. So, one, in one place, um, I think it was Livingston was the one on, uh, out there first. Thank you. Okay. Um, he, he, had, he had ulcers. And so he had a goat. The goat's milk helped. And he got to one place, and guess what the chief wanted? 
his goat. He had to give up his goat. Cut the covenant. But and what he got? He got a spear in return. What he didn't know was later on he found out as he traveled through um, uh, interior places in Africa, that spear was the spear of the strongest chief in that area. And anybody that would have touched Livingston at that time, that tribe would have come and hunted them down and wiped them out. He just didn't know it. He thinking, oh, I got out of the deal with a spear. <laughs> there was a spear of protection. The symbolism of it was protection. And so God comes to Abram and cuts a covenant. Amen? Well, we know from Deuteronomy that, there's, that, that we have, that we have the, uh, the blessings and the cursings of the covenant. Amen? First 15 verses are the blessings. The last 45 are the curses. I mean, you're going to get the M rods and all those kinds of stuff. I'm like, what are they? They don't sound good, whatever they are, you know. Um, and so think about this. God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my covenant with you. I am going to be your God to you. Amen. And then he you know, goes on and says, and in blessing, you know, uh, I'm trying to remember which exactly, uh, if it's in, later in this chapter or in the next one. But he, he tells him he's going to bless him. Hallelujah. Yeah. So, you know, and here he, he, he tells them he's going to bless them, make them exceedingly fruitful, and um, tells them he'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee. Amen. Not what you want, you know. You, you want to be on the bless, blessing side of blessing Abraham. Amen. So God said, I'll be a God. God initiates all of this. Think about that. He sought him out. To make a covenant with him. Everybody say, wow. wow. Say it backwards. Wow. Thank you. Say it upside down. Mom. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. God's saying, I will be God to you. <clears throat> I will be your supplier. I will be your covering. I will take care of you. Now, all you've got to do is do what I tell you to do. He didn't make it real hard. Amen. He didn't say you've got to bring me a million dollars. You know, when God comes, to, when, when God made covenant so that we could come into it, we brought what? Us. This is an unequal covenant. Now, I used to say, I don't, you know, I, well, you know, it, it wasn't unequal, but yes, it really is. I used to say, you know, God got us, which is what he wanted. It was a, it's referred to in, um, uh, I believe Hebrew, diateke, D-I-A-T-E-K-E, -E, unequal covenant. Meaning one party has everything and seeks out and searches for the other party who has nothing yet chooses to make a covenant with them anyway, knowing they have nothing to give except themselves. Amen. There was no, no wealth. There was no blessings we could bring to God. There was, there was nothing naturally we could bring to God. And even spiritually speaking, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. So there was nothing. So the, the, the party who was the beneficiary of this dietetic covenant was us. What God got in return was a restoration with his creation. Hallelujah. And that's what he wanted. He sought us out through Abraham. To make a covenant whereby he could have his, his, his people, his creation, restored to him. Glory to God. I'm glad he did. I said I'm glad he did. Hallelujah. Praise God. So now this covenant has been made.
think about that. Shall I hide this thing from Abraham, which I'm about to do? You, gotta, everybody, you just got to go wow again. He's the creator of the universe. He can do anything he wants to do. But that was going to affect Abraham because his nephew and the family had gotten caught up in the lascivious sinfulness of Sodom and Gomorrah, and God's getting ready to wipe it out. And then we had the first inter major, inter well, the first recorded intercessory prayer. Will not the God of heaven do right? Per adventure, there'll be a hundred righteous souls. You know, God says, well, for a hundred, I'll do it. And Abraham, the original Jew, starts going down. Thank you. Come on, guys. That's, you know? Yeah. That's where they get some of these terminologies, like Ju you Jewed me, and because they, they bargained you right on down to nothing. Except he stopped ten people short. He honestly did. Actually nine. Abraham could have taken it one step further and said, will you spare them for my sake? And God would have. He just, he was afraid to push it even further. He could have asked for his sake. Will you do it for me? And God would have said yes. How do you know? Because he went from 100 to 9 to 10. He already done it 90. Got rid of 90. All he had to do was come up with 10. Abraham's probably thinking, I, I can find 10. I well, couldn't. But he's, in, he's the covenant man with God. God's, he, and, and, you know, and I got to believe that God's looking, smiling, thinking, here, okay, this is why I chose him. You know, because he would, he would honor me by ac accessing the covenant and the covenant right to receive blessings in the earth. In thee all the nations shall be blessed. Amen? Hallelujah. And, um, but God came down and said, well, got to have a talk with you, blood covenant partner. Uh, you, you know how it's going over there in Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, I'm sure he's heard, yeah. Well, I'm getting ready to wipe them out. So get your family out of there because I'm coming to destroy it. Now, before you, you, you run off and, and do this, Lord, if I can find 90, 100 people that, that are righteous, will you, will you spare them? I'll spare them for 100. I got thinking, eh, let's, let's go. You think he would do it for 90? He just keeps working down. And God keeps saying yes. Not one time did he go, I say, I say, boy, don't ask me another one. He never, he never did that. He just kept saying yes. That's why I honestly believe Abraham said, if you do, will you do it just for me? Because I ask you to. He's in covenant. God would have honored his request. Amen. Hallelujah. And so let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy, 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 Deuteronomy. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. So far. Lynn Meek has a song called Deuteronomy 20. Uh, yeah, Deuteronomy 28. I'm blessed in the city and the country too. Blessed in everything I set my hand to. <laughs> Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. <laughs> you sing it at Copeland's and you sing it at Hagen's Camp Meeting. And yeah, I still got the cassette. <laughs> <coughs> Hallelujah. God speaking says this to the people of Israel from Mount Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass that thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings will come on thee. And overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. So, what did God always command? Obedience. When you come to the table, all you, obedience. Do what, I, do what I ask you to do. Okay? All right? 
made provision for failure to do that. He did. There was, there was a way to be forgiven. He, he instituted the, the um, and, and, um, when the law was given, he instituted, you know, means of forgiveness. So if they didn't obey, they could get that right. It wasn't a one time and you're out deal. Aren't you? Yes. Thank God. Thank God. Hallelujah. And then he goes off and says, all, all these blessings come on thee and overtake thee. Blessed shalt thou be in the city and the country. And he goes on down through verse 14. And then it starts in 15. 15 says, but if it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do his commandments and statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee. What's the first one? Thou be cursed in the city and in the field. In the bat and he goes on for 45, 46 more verses. You know, I mean, it ain't good. Okay? He said the curses will come on you, overtake you, pursue you. <laughs> ah! They're going to chase you down. You're going to have sore botches on the legs. And you won't be healed. Sole your foot to the top of your head. I mean, <laughs> I can't remember where the Emrods were, but I didn't like them. <laughs> the what? No, they're hemorrhoids. I thought that's what they were. I didn't want to. <laughs> there won't be enough preparation H to fix it. <laughs> Glory to God. Yeah. Okay. And so he lays out all these curses. Now, it says, you know, he, that he will smite you. And now, Dr. Young, Young's an, uh, Analytical Concordance, Dr. Robert Young, uh, in his book, Hints and Helps to Bible Interpretation, writes on the word smite. You know, I will smite thee with this and smite thee with that throughout this passage. It says it, it actually should have been translated, allow to be smitten. For God is not the smiter. Okay. In other words, you will remove his hand of protection that it was given unto you in the covenant for disobeying. Okay? And so, God doesn't give you cancer, but if you walk in rebellious disobedience to him, you take yourself out from under his protection and you will be allowed to be smitten. That's where we get into Job. Okay? Only all that all is in your hand, only touch not his life. Why? Because he had not taken his hand of protection off that area because he hadn't violated obedience or faith in that area. He was in fear in all the others. Fear is disobedience. Okay? So, we get the blessing. We get the cursing. We get the fact that God's not actually the one doing it, but you have, you know, it's like the spear being broken in half. You're out there in the middle of a tribe that the only reason they're not killing you is you got the spear of that chief, and it gets broken in half, and you are toast because they're sitting up in the trees and you don't even know it. Oh, they don't have the spear. <laughs> Supper's on. <laughs> they shrink the head. Deuteronomy 28, 47. God is good. He provides abundance to all things. He says here, because you serve not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things, therefore shall you serve thine enemies. See, we have to serve the Lord. Church is not about how can we get into this thing, get by and get into heaven, and still live like the world. That's what some of this extreme grace teaching does. I didn't say all grace teaching. I said extreme. Okay? There's extreme faith teaching. There's extreme sovereignty teaching. Okay? There's a lot of things in the Bible that people go to extremes with and build whole doctrines around them that are imbalanced. I mean, um, your predestinationist are usually, you know, tulip, the tulip teaching is an acronym. You got the irresistible grace of God. 
you're going to get saved whether you like it or not because God's grace is irresistible. Well, if that were so, everybody on the planet would be saved. But they're not because God has chosen certain ones to be saved. <clears throat> now, why would a God who could give irresistible grace and save everybody that we know he's not willing that they should perish? Because the Bible says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. Why would he who possesses irresistible grace refuse to give it and only give it to certain ones who now you now call the elect and let everybody else go to hell, although he's not willing that they should go to hell? Okay? Now you get on the other side of that, then people read that one verse, you know, he's not willing that any should perish, and everybody's going to get saved. We go into universalism. Okay? So people get all wh whacked out with stuff. They get to take tests. And so some of the extreme grace teaching gets involved in these things. And all of a sudden, you know, you're just going to live hunky-dory. You're going to live blessed. You know, God, God's totally good. Therefore, nothing evil is going to ever, nothing bad is ever going to happen to you. And uh, I can tell you who they didn't get that from. Brother Hagin. You might take a quote out of a book that's that without anything around it and, ma and make it say something that didn't say. I, I can't tell you how many times I heard him say, some folks think they're going through life on flowery beds of ease like ripe cherries falling off the tree. But they don't do anything. Just, you know, oh, it just falls on you. The blessings are falling on me. I, I haven't done anything because I'm under grace. Or, you know, I got faith. All I got to do is say it and it happens and, you know, I get everything in the world. Well, no. You got to take all of it in context. God is good. But if you don't, what do you say? All the covenant was based on, I'm going to make my covenant with you. Of course. If you will hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God this day, all these blessings will come on you. That's it. God's made, God initiated it. God sought you out. God presented this to you. So here's what I'm going to do. All you got to do in this dietechy, unequal covenant is do like I ask you to do. Hello? Amen. And I don't have to give up anything. You just do what he asks you to do. Man, I can go party hard. No, 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 no. He asks you not to do that. Ask you not to run around with somebody else's wife. Amen. He com well, really commands you not to ask you. Commands you not to be a pervert. Is that too mean? It's still the truth. Okay? I don't care if you think you're praying to the non-binary, gender-neutral spirit or not. Which is when I heard on Facebook, no, uh, on a video the other day, somebody with a little sash on in some church, looked like a, like a Methodist or something. We're praying to the non-binary, gender-neutral spirit. I don't know if I have enough anointing all around to get rid of that one on that right then. They need a Duncan. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so, God is good. So now we have this thing that Israel lives with from, you know, blessings and cursing. In, w through a covenant initiated by God, presented, and, and when you go back and look um, when the law was given, and the law was added as a schoolmaster, remember that, because the people weren't living out of faith in, with the covenant God made with Abraham, so he gave the law to keep them on track. Okay, no, you, no, no, you can't do that. You can't do this. No, no, you can't do that. This is what I want you to do. Follow after this. So gave them all the stuff in writing because they were being hard-headed. Okay, yeah, so just do like I ask you to do. If you don't, go get a sin offering. Go get a trespass offering. Take it to the priest, and that that that'll push that off for another year. You know, we can keep this thing going until Jesus gets here and redeems it completely. All right? And um, he's so good. He gave 
he gave the law, and we, he first gave the covenant, added the law, and the Bible tells us the New Testament, it was given to keep, I'm just paraphrasing this to kind of simplify it. He gave it to them because they weren't doing right, so to keep them straight, he gave, them, gave it to them in writing. Because his, his, his desire was, as he says, I believe in Ezekiel, that I'll write my laws in your hearts and in your minds, not in tables of stone, but in thy heart. That's what he wanted. He wanted a heart relationship, not a legalistic relationship. And here, here's where the extreme grace comes in. Because God didn't want to write the laws in, in tables of stone where they had to go, well, I did this, 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 I'm okay. He wanted it in their heart where it was a heart relationship that you didn't do X, Y, and Z because of the heart relationship with him. Not because there was a commandment not to do it. Because you knew in your heart this would dishonor and displease God. Amen. That's what he wanted the heart. He wanted the people to follow them out of their heart and do right because they wanted to, not because they had to. They wanted their life to be a pleasing thing to him. They wanted their actions. He wanted their actions to please him. Because they loved him. Because they wanted to honor him. They wanted to please him. Then you get people come along telling you, well, you're under grace, you're pre-forgiven. Yeah, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to obey. You don't have to submit. You don't have to go to church. Da, 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 da. It should be. It shouldn't be that you don't have to do something. It should be, because I love God, I want to go to church. I want to tithe. I want to honor him. Amen. Out of the heart. We are longs to, to be in fellowship and communion with him, not how can I get out of obedience and still make heaven? And take things written in the Word, and as Peter said about Paul's writings, many which are unlearned do rest, W-R-E-S-T, the Scriptures. And it means to twist, basically misinterpret. Why? Because that's what their flesh wants. So instead of allowing their heart to lead them into pleasing God, because they want to. You know, you want, as a, as, a, as a married couple, you want to please your spouse. Not, oh, well, they had gummies, they had work, they got to buy a present. <laughs> well, I can tell you, man, if you, if you had that attitude and your wife knew you had that attitude and you brought it to her, she might would take it, but she wouldn't enjoy it because you didn't want to do it in the first place. You had to, because there would be, there would be something to pay if you didn't. <laughs> That's how you're thinking. I ain't never gonna hear the end of it if I don't do it. Not, I love my wife. I want to bless her and honor her, and be appreciative to her for all that she is. So I got her this gift because I wanted to, not because you were gonna have to listen to it forever. You remember on the 35th anniversary, you didn't buy me anything? <laughs> Had to order my own. Put your name on it. Hello. Well, that doesn't honor. That doesn't bless. God doesn't want you coming to church because you're browbeating to coming to church. You better come to church and all this. I mean, Paul had to write. You know, forsake not the assembly yourselves together as of the manner of some. Because you had hard noses. You might go back to the old covenant and read. I was glad when they said, let us go up into the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. And they're coming this Sunday.
great day in the morning. Yeah. If I don't show up, Pastor is going to text me. <laughs> and he's going to say, we missed you. Hope everything's okay. What he's really saying is, why won't you in church? <laughs> Which is what I'm really saying. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. I don't send something that, you know, you miss the service, I don't send something. And if you miss two or three or whatever, you know, and you're always there, then we're wanting to know what's going on. Because you, do you need prayer? Is something happening? We can make sure you're okay. Are you here? Sometimes you get back, well, uh, I decided to go somewhere else. Okay. Well, all I'm doing is driving the bus, doors open, okay, we love you, come back if you want to. You know? I became I became the pastoral bus driver. Glory to God. So anyway, here's this covenant with a good God, but there are penalties or conse consequences, not really penalties, consequences for disobeying the covenant. The staying of the enemy isn't there. And he will come clean your clock. He don't care how the door gets open. He just wants to get in there. Um about tw I guess about 20 years ago now, Microsoft went down all over the world, everywhere. What happened? <coughs> Programmers were doing, you know, they're always writing update codes and all this kind of stuff. And one of, the, one of the programmers somewhere in the system, Microsoft's in, server side in, left the gateway open. And all the hackers in the world which are constantly trying to hack Microsoft. One found it, and the next thing you know, every hacker on the planet's going in, and they wiped out. Now, they were smart enough to have redundancy backup. And so when that happened, they shut it down, but by then the damage had been done. It took two weeks to bring Microsoft back up. They had to shut it down, find where it got in, close that portal, wipe out all the bad code that got in there, and rebuild it from their backup. Okay? The devil's always looking to see if, you, if you're opening the door. He's looking for the opportunity to come in. He lives to clean your clock. Now, the good thing is, you can repent and close that gate. You, you can go, Lord, I, 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 I'm sorry, my heart was not right here. My actions weren't right because my heart wasn't right. Hello. I listened to some teachers that told me that I could go ahead and commit adultery with my neighbor's wife because I was pre-forgiven. Now, if the neighbor's wife's husband finds out, let me know how that worked out for you. <laughs> or maybe I'm doing your funeral. Okay? If anybody says stuff like that, it tells me one thing. The heart's not right. The heart's not right before God. Forget trying to, you know, parse semantic terminology in Scripture that you can get away with it. Your heart's not right. Because if your heart was right, you wouldn't want to dishonor the Father by your actions. You would live with the purpose of pleasing him. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, and so here's this covenant sitting out there. And <laughs> uh, I have pontificated so much I'm running out of time. In um, Matthew 5.17, Jesus makes this statement. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So let me, let me add in here in this because people get so cute. Try, I don't know why. I just don't understand the mindset 
of ministers in particular wanting to lead people astray. Well, I do understand it. You want to sell books and materials. You want to have a big ministry. You've got a heavy levy. That levy is too heavy, honey. Why they would want to teach people it's okay to do what God says not okay to do. They missed the whole spirit of what was done. Jesus said, I'm not coming here to do away with thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. I've come to fulfill that. How? By bringing you into a heart relationship with God, where out of that relationship you won't want to do that because it displeases and dishonors God. Amen? You see? So I'm not here to wipe it out so you can go do it. That's what Jesus is saying. This is God's moral code. This is God's moral law. The things that were in the law. Now, we're not here to live under the law because that is a natural means of trying to achieve salvation. I want to bring you into a salvation out of your heart where you will not do the things he told you not to do and do the things that he told you to do because that's how you are. You've been born again. The life of God's in you. The nature of God's in you. Now your desire is to do that. You desire. You don't need, if you're really right with God, if you really serve God, you will not want to take his name in vain because it's precious to you. Are you here? When you go through the, the biggie, the top ten, you know, the Ten Commandments, the, the biggies, and the 2,990 other ones, you know, which might be don't walk so far on Sunday or whatever. Um, okay. Again, you know, the Sabbath um, was for to be a day of rest to honor the Lord. You know, they were forced to set aside time and they couldn't travel. They, in other words, you couldn't add activities into your life that would make you so you wouldn't have time set aside for God. But in the new birth, in the kingdom of God, being born again, having the heart of God in you, you shouldn't have to have thou shalt get up this morning and get your rear end to church. <laughs> you should be excited. It's church day. I get to go and fellowship with the saints and worship my father corporately. Now, but not just one day a week. Now it's you want, every day is a Sabbath day to you because they that have entered into faith have entered into rest. And so you can be resting in the Lord every day. We come back to this, this major relationship emphasis. Okay? So Jesus said, um, think not that I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I've come to fulfill them. Because in me, the purpose of all of that is met. It's fulfilled in, by being born of me, by being born again, by being an heir and a joint heir with me. All that, all of that which dictated how to do what you're supposed to do with God has now been wrapped up into a relationship through Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about, fulfill, fulfilling the law. So it wasn't, I'm X and out, thou shalt not commit adultery, because that's the law. God still doesn't think adultery, doesn't believe adultery is right. It still dishonors him. But now we do it. Two reasons. Number one, you love God, don't want to dishonor God, and you love your spouse. Hello. You know? Well, she got a lot, you know, she got she put on some pounds and she's gotten older. She ain't the hot chick I married. Well, you ain't the hunk she married either. You most of the time you become a chunk and not a hunk.
that was funnier than you're all laughing. <laughs> She's not impressed with your chest hair, gray chest hair, and a gold chain down here now. That's not doing anything for her. Okay. Romans 10.4. Romans 10.4. Hallelujah. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. He didn't say Christ ended the law. He is the end of the law. I'm, I'm just going to keep harping on this because he came and took legalism and brought it to a place where it can now be relationship. The power of the curse of the law is broken through a relationship. Hallelujah. It's still wrong to steal. It's still wrong to take innocent life. It's still wrong to use the name of the Lord thy God in vain. It's still wrong to covet. Amen. It's still, still wrong to bear false witness. Lord, we just messed up the church. Like Brother Hagin said, used to say, there are some folks that can sit in the living room, got a tongue so long, they can sit in the living room and lick a spoon in the kitchen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, how many churches have we been around that, I mean, they had the gossip club. You know, they had the fishing club and they had the, you know, uh, shopping club, and they had this, but they also had the gossip club. They had a prayer line, but they had a gossip hotline. Okay? I experienced that. Yeah, in my own life. Gossip hotline, I mean, I'm on my way to Oklahoma, and it made it back to the church before I got four hours down the road. I, I, it's a longer story. I, I don't want to tell it publicly, you know. But gossip hotline in the church. Yeah. Phone calls. I mean, ringing phones off the wall. Did you know? Mm -hmm. Well, this is why Galatians chapter um, 3, verse 29 declares, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having been made a curse for us, where it's written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Glory to God. See, he came and took all the whatever um, in, relate, in, in, in regards to the curse into him. Because remember, the curse was based on what? Why did that come? Being disobedient. If you'll do this, obey, you're going to get blessed over here. If you disobey, you're going to get cursed over here. Now Christ comes and says, come into me and the blessings will come on you. We look at Galatians 3, um, 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, or is written cursed to everyone that hangeth on a tree. Why? That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Let's go to Hebrews 11. 1. But without faith, it's impossible. I mean, verse 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. For they that cometh to him must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that, him that what? Diligently seek him. Oh, this is hard. Your heart's seeking after God. So this is faith. Faith, seeking after God, is part of this faith that we're talking about here. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Amen? Think of it. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it's written, curse to everyone that hangeth on a tree. That or so that, or for the very purpose of the blessing of Abraham coming on us. 
Gentiles. So they might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. We're back over in this relationship thing again. Because in Christ, he's taken the curse, which happens because of disobedience, and changed it so we're not living our life under a legalistic, I got to do this. But we're living our life in a relationship with Jesus Christ that we're inspired. Philippians chapter 2. I believe Cindy quoted it this weekend. Okay. Okay. And I'm sure Ellie has her amplified up available. <clears throat> King James says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Okay. Ellie, read it, uh, 213. And stop, let me quote it so we can get on the microphone. Oh. I guess Miss Emma's going to bring it up to me. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. He says here, not in your own strength, for it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you, energizing and creating in you the power and desire both to will and to work for him, no, to will, want to. To work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. That's relationship. That's not legalism. He's creating you the will. He's creating in you the will. To work. Amen. Think of that. This is how the the the, the curse that comes from disobedience is broken because your heart's wanting to, to honor him. You're not being obstinate, you're not being rebellious. If you fall into sin, um, you're repentant. We've got so many people right now trying to teach everybody you don't need to repent. That's, that's the extreme grace is all about that. You don't need to repent. You're under grace. He's already forgiven you. Yeah. What about the heart side of the relationship where you didn't want to do it because you didn't want to dishonor him? And so you want him to know that you, 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 you didn't want to do that and you were wrong to do it. Not because it's going to send you to hell. Because you want it right between you and the Lord. I mean, everybody's, you know, first John, I mean, first John 2, 9, you know, is not talking about repenting for sin. It's just debates. Let me just flat out tell you this. Brother, if your heart's condemned you not, then you have confidence towards God. Well, how do I keep my heart from condemning me? If you've missed the mark, if you sin, get it right. Notice it's your heart. It wasn't the action. If your heart's not condemning you for the action. If you've got actions in your life that your own heart's condemning you for, you need to get it right so you can get that relationship in, in, a, in a healthy position. And the quicker you do it, the better off you are. Not re listen to somebody's tape series about, well, you don't have to repent. You're under grace. Well, it don't, you know, I know it's wrong. I shouldn't have done it, but oh, well. I'm already, I'm pre-forgiven, so let me just go on with life. You may as well go ahead and get the, the uh, iron out and go ahead and get, your, and get it on your conscience and go, shh, and do a little searing. Because the more that you do that and the more you think that way, the further away from the relationship that God created for him through Jesus Christ you're getting. The heart of the relationship the right desires out of that relationship. 
to the point it will become, <coughs> well, I'm going to get to heaven so it don't matter. Why would you even want to go if you don't love him any more than that? Well, I just Because I don't want to go to hell. It's not about God. It's about you not having to pay any penalty. That's not a relationship. It's like, well, I've got to stay married to him because, you know, the retirement, you know. All our money's wrapped up together. I bet your wife will love that one. <laughs> Hello? Are you here? That's not, that's not love. That's not relationship. You created a bondage situation for the sole purpose of some natural gain. Or even if it's a spiritual gain. Amen? Did y'all get anything out of that? I'm going to stop there. So, our redemption from the curse is redemption from serving God legalistically and suffering consequences because of disobedience and brought into a relationship where we serve God and do what the law says God wants. Not because we have to, but because we want to. We desire God. Desire to please him. Desire to love him. Desire to be a, a, a point of um, honorable representation of him because you want his him and his name to be honored because you love him. And you want other people to have that same relationship with him. Amen. What are you talking about? I know. Because there's revelation there. There's understanding there. We really can't go further in this without having that position. I don't come to church and give because I want to have a house. Well, I was at Prosperity Church, man. They say if you give, if you give, you know, hundred dollars, you're gonna get a hundredfold return. That's about ten thousand dollars. I'm gonna go over there and get me ten, ten grand. You may as well go play the lottery. You're just playing spiritual lottery. Thinking maybe I'll roll the dice and, and hit the jackpot. Come on. He said, come on. When you start preaching, you get all the preachers together and tell everybody, well, you got to bless, you got to give to the higher anointing and you'll get blessed. One preacher said, I said, I didn't even preach that week and got $25,000. People just walking by. They knew who you were. Honestly, if it works that way, then the guy sitting down at the back of the church who mops wall floors for Walmart and I ought to have been blessed. Amen. I want to, I want to honor the people who Bring the word. We're told to. You should do it because you want to. Not because parents are there. Look here. We got this pe these people here this week, and we need to give them a really big offering so we can brag about how big our offering is. And they'll tell other people they'll want to come here. You don't have to do that. You don't have to think about that. You start giving big offers, everybody wants to come. Word gets out. Everybody wants to come. He go to that church right there, man. I guarantee you, going to get. Yeah, I heard about your church. Want to come bless you, brother? <laughs> Where were you when we had, you know, no money in the bank? I had I had a guest speaker call me during that time. We're gonna have to have him back because I told him I would. And I want to. Okay, not not just because I have to. I said, look. We just want to come bless your church. We'll pay our own way to get up there. You know, you do whatever you can do. We want to come help. Okay? The only person that did. The only person that made that. Now, look, I know others that would have. If, you know, they, that, this person actually called and said, 
Because I told him, I said, we can't afford to have him eat. We can't give you, a, we can't get you a hotel room. Can't take you out to eat. Can't even pay. I don't know if we can pay for your gas to drive here. Forget flying. And they wanted to come anyway. Now, let me tell you what happens to those like that, to people like that. <coughs> <coughs> they'll go somewhere else and they'll get their socks pressed off and they'll make up anything they gave up to come bless the other church. A number of years ago, we had a, a friend of mine who was, I went to Raymond with, traveling minister, still traveling today, and um, I mean, and, and doing really well. And um, before he came to our church, he had had two churches that had hardly any people in them that wanted him to come, and the Lord told him to go, and he went, and he said, "Ed, I lost money." He said, that, "He said I've got an amp go back, you know, he's got one, one, one kind of Amex card. You got to pay it off every month." And he was getting ready to travel overseas, um, the minister, and he needed like I forgot how much money he needed. Um, like he had to have like money to pay off the, the Amex bill and another almost thousand dollars to buy his airline tickets to go overseas to this 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 trip that was planned. And he came to our church and ministered. It's awesome. We received the offerings and um, one of the offerings I got up and um, the Lord told him to take up an offering for Pastor Ed and Janie. So that night's offering went to us. It didn't go to him. And so we received the last offering that night. And, uh, and I tell him how much it is, you know. And um, it's not enough. It's not enough to pay the, what he needs. He said, Joe, yeah, well, yeah, I wish it was more. I said, it's, it's okay. It's okay. He said, but brother, I, you know, well, I get home at night and recount the offering. And... Um, One of the checks, I counted as a hundred dollars. It was a thousand. That was a nine hundred dollar difference. And so the next one, I pick him up, take him to the airport, and I, and I got the check in my hand and the envelope, and I say, "Look, look, you know, um, look. I know I told you last night how much to offer because I know you need to let your wife know so she could take care of stuff. And uh, I know it wasn't enough." I said, "And uh, but, but, brother." I am so sorry. I miscounted it. He said, no, look, I'm sorry. It's okay. It's all right. God's going to take it. I said, yeah. He said, uh, you know, I told you it was 20. It was 2,600, and, and I miscounted. I messed up. It's 3,500. <laughs> <laughs> that paid off the Amex bill, bought the airline ticket with money left over. See, but he had gone to churches that were small that couldn't do anything, and the Lord told him to go, and he went to bless them, knowing they couldn't do anything financially to help. And he came to the next church, and, uh, of course, being a good friend, I would, if it had been maybe another minister, I would have done that. But since he was a really good friend, I ragged him, you know. Oh, man, I'm just so sorry. I messed it up. <laughs> it, it wasn't 26. It was, it was 35. I milked it. <laughs> of course, he was a rascal at Ramah, so he deserved it. <laughs> yeah. He used to, I was a door monitor. He would come in to class and take his ID badge and lick it and stick it on his forehead. <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. Let's receive tonight's offering and go home. Right, sincere. That was sincere heart. Amen. Glory to God. All right. The alpha envelope in the back seat back in front of you. Be given by electronic means. Go ahead. If you're out there watching us and want to bless, go ahead and do so by PayPal or uh, Cash App. Our Cash App is <coughs> dollar sign Expedition Triad. PayPal is give at expeditiontriad.org. Praise God. Father, we thank you for the offering. 
The people are blessed with great abundance because of their heart towards you and because of your heart towards us. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Joe, go ahead and receive that. Everybody say glory be to God forevermore. Hallelujah. All right. Thank you all for joining us. Forget, don't forget. Don't, yeah, don't, no, not forget. Don't forget these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you. Good night. And see you next time here at Expedition Church of 